Well, hello. I'm so glad that you joined us today for the Irving Church of God for the midweek service. And um, what a privilege, what an absolute privilege. Um, I hope that uh, you have had a good week and included in that week. I hope that you spent some time in the Lord's presence. And again, when we sit and we listen to these, these messages, remember they're coming from the Lord and they're coming to help purge us or clean us. He's not coming to bash us to where we feel like, oh, I don't do anything right. No, the Lord's pointing out areas in our life that He wants us to pay attention to. Why? Because we're going to talk about that this morning. Anyway, so let's pray. Let's, let's pray for the lost. Number one, I always pray for the lost. Whether it's your family, my family, whoever, the lost. I don't want anyone to spend eternity in hell. No one. And let's pray for our young people because this is a hard time for them too. You know, a lot of young people um, are used to going and going and doing and a lot of that's been stopped for now. And let's pray for the parents too to give them, that the parents would have wisdom on how to answer some questions about some things that's going on in the world. And mostly too, let's pray for this election coming up. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual election. I'm telling you, it's a spiritual election. It, it, it could be the life of our country as we know it and, and we need to pray for God's will before you go into that voting booth pray for God's will to be done God's agenda to be lifted up Lord I just thank you Lord God for this word today I thank you for your mercy and your love I thank you for each one Father who's, who's has is listening today took time out of their day God to listen to this message from you and I thank you God I thank you God that you're a God who challenges us you call us to a higher place, Lord, and I thank you for that. And, Lord, I pray, too, Lord God, that for the lost, Lord. I pray for the lost, God, that, that when if there is someone lost listening, and I pray they are, are listening today, Father, that they would be driven and challenged in it, 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 whatever it takes to draw them closer to you, Lord God. And I pray for this message today, Lord. It's not an easy one, but God, I've never been given easy lessons. It's not a storybook. And I thank you. Amen. I want to remind each one of us of that, just what the Lord had brought, had brought to my mind as we were praying, that the messages seem like they're so hard sometimes and seem like, God, you know, but God... There's so much that can keep us out of heaven, and the Lord wants to make us aware of those things because His desire is for us to spend eternity in heaven. The name of our message today is Wake Up, the Day is Approaching, or Wake Up Church, Come Out of That Coma. Yep, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming, as John the Baptist proclaimed. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. I say to you listening today, Jesus is coming. What hour, when, I don't know, but he's coming. And he's coming, and just as John the Baptist said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. We sing about it, we get excited about it, we hear about it, but are we living like this is the truth? Almost every message that's come forth, I know out of this little pulpit, within the last month or two or whatever, has been the same theme. It'll be the same theme, because there's only one message. Jesus is coming. That is the message. At times I think what we have the mindset, as long as I'm doing well, I'm not going to rock the boat. I listen to what God gave me yesterday. I am here to remind us that the boat has been rocking, but we have become so accustomed to it. And the sad part is that we've allowed it to rock us to sleep. This boat has been rocking. The world has been rocking. The world has been, has been, has been just exploding. The world has been going so far t to the wrong side that, the, the, that we have become so accustomed to hearing the noise that we no longer hear the message. God is who, praise you, Lord. God is, to, is reminding us again today, his message has not changed. The message you and I, the church, who is the, not the building, but the people, we as the church need to proclaim the same message. And again, I'm going to say it. I'm here to remind us that the boat has been rocking, but we have become so accustomed to it that the sad part is we've become allowed it to rock us to sleep. The church by far is asleep. 
The church by far is asleep. The church by far has lost their way as far as the why we're here. Why we're here. We as a people have become so distracted by the ploys and screams of, uh, schemes of Satan that we have been into a low form of a coma. The church has become ineffective. And I'm talking about me too. We're the church. We are the church. But we have become ineffective in this world because we are just letting the world lull us into a coma. What is a spiritual coma? A spiritual coma, comatose state can be likened to a physical coma. Now listen to this. A condition which is somewhat like being asleep. If you were to visit a patient in a coma in a hospital bed, he looks like someone asleep. He's inactive, he's unconscious, but he's still alive. Since his heart's still beating and he is still breathing. But unlike a sleeping man, the patient does not wake up after a few hours. He remains in the state of unconsciousness for a few days or weeks and in rare cases for years. It is normal for us to sleep as our body needs sufficient rest, but it is abnormal for a person to remain asleep for too long, for that means he is comatose. That's what's happened to us as a church, y'all. We can look back and we can go back to the beginnings. We can go back to the, even the Bible times and we can see the activity of the church. We can see where the church was making such a difference in the world that the world wanted to kill the people of the church. And we, we a spiritual man to a spiritual man, if you're in a spiritual coma, that isn't deadly to your soul and to the souls of those you should be witnessing to, to the ones that we should have been pointing the way to God. We've got to wake up, church. Wake up. Come out of that comatose state. Come out of that coma. Come out. Come alive. Don't wait to, don't, don't we see that the, what the devil has got so, so, so many schemes. I'm sorry. I'm just getting, oh, so he's got so many schemes. He, he, he gets the church with their attention on everything but the lost. The church's attention is on all kinds of stuff, but it's not on the lost. We've got to get back to that place. We've got to come out of the coma, out of the deception, out of the, out of the distractions of this world. The distractions of this world has become a, like a coma to the church. We've kind of gotten swept up in that bubble. We need to come out of that thing. Why? Because the day of the Lord is approaching. I'm telling you, we're spending too much precious time just to keep our own heads above water. That the lost are headed straight into the flames of hell. We're, we're trying to get these formulas concocted so people will want to come and we're, which I understand that to a degree. I have a pastor also and it, of course it breaks his heart when, the, when people go away. But the point is that he, we need to stay focused on the fact of we are here to save the lost. We're here to point them to Jesus. We've got to get out of the boat and quit being rocked in the boat. Oh my. Listen. We're spending too much precious time. Too much. Ooh, we don't hear this. Listen to this. We're spending too much precious time just to keep our own heads above water that the lost are headed straight into the flames of hell. We do not hear the screams because we are asleep in a comatose host state. God, please forgive us. Forgive us. Right outside our church doors. Right outside the building. Everywhere we go, they're lost. Our focus needs to be on hearing the voice of God when that spirit says speak to this one and speak to that one. We've got to come out from among them and we've got to come out from among them. We've got to come out. We have to get our eyes back on Jesus. We've got to get our focus back on why we are here. Why? Because the day of the Lord is approaching. We sit by, have sat by and allowed this world to tell us what we can say how we're to live, and what we can stand for. 
Look at the woman now. The woman they're interviewing for the Supreme Court. They've attacked her more on her faith and her moral standing than on her ability to be a judge. And that's what the world's doing. And what do we expect? Read your word. The word tells us that's the way it's going to be. And the persecution hasn't started in America like it has in other places. Because we've got to be ready. Because ready or not, Jesus is coming. Ready or not, persecution is coming. Ready or not, we're going to have to take a stand. And if you, like they all say, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. When is, listen to this, when it is now the law of the land for the, the very law of God to be turned into hate speech, we have a problem. Wake up, church. Wake up. When, listen, when it is the, now the law of the land that the very laws of God to be turned into hate speech, we have a problem. When it's wrong, that when it's hate speech to call sin, sin, we have a problem, church. Rise up. We as a church, we as a people, we as a people of God should be on our faces. Are we on our faces? Are we in our prayer closet? Are we asking the Lord, what do I do in this time? What do I do, God? And I guarantee you, God ain't going to tell you to go run for the hills, hide, and let them fend for themselves. That's what Jonah had wanted to do. But God, God is looking for somebody to stand in the hedge. Oh, my. My gracious. Whoa. We, when we can no longer stand for thus saith the Lord, we have a problem. How can this all be? How, how, can, how can this all be? Because the church has been in a comatose state for so long, we've become accustomed to not moving, not being. What, what is going to change the hearts of young people, old people? And middle-aged people is the Word of God only and the pure Word of God. The pure Word of God is like a hammer in a fire. The pure Word of God is, is not going to come and tickle your ears. The pure Word of God is going to be just like a laser that's going to point out things in my life and your life that need to be fixed. A pure learn that when, when we get out our, and we live our life like we should be living for the Lord when we're awake, because if, oh my, I don't want to get ahead of myself, we talk about climate change, but we are dared to talk about soul change. We are. We can talk about climate change all day long, but we, but we are dared. Don't you dare talk about soul change. Well, I'm going to talk about soul change. Because I, that's the only thing that will change. I boldly declare to you that God is the one who holds the thermostat on this world, not us. And one day it will all change. But in the meantime, we have got to wake up. We have got to get back to where we, the only thing that matters is thus saith the Lord. God says it's right, it's right. God says it's wrong, it's wrong. And then live that thing. Live it. Oh my even advertisements, I saw it again, where the dogs, and I think I talked about that a few weeks ago, and about these animals, and about how they're, they're dying, and please send money, it's so pitiful, and it is! But where's the advertisements for the millions of babies being aborted every time, all the time? All over this world. Where's, who's crying out for them? Church, we've got to wake up! Woo! We're, we are not to declare the truth according to this. We are not to declare the truth according to the precepts of God. They, they don't want to hear it. Well, I don't care if they want to hear it. When in the Old Testament, when Paul's day, when Noah's day, they didn't want to hear it either. But that doesn't shut the mouth of God. Oh, my, my, my. Am I fired up? Yeah, I'm fired up. Why? Because I want the church to wake up. We are called to be a mighty army. And if you're a child of God, whoop. We need to fall on our face and repent. I remember years ago I spoke with a man back at the hospital in New Orleans. And I spoke with this man who had a um, niece, I think, was in a, um, an automobile accident. And was in a coma and had been in a coma for a long time. And this man was talking to me and he said years ago this happened to him. He was in some sort of accident. And that he was in a coma as well. And that he said towards, he doesn't know at what part of the coma, but he could hear the people talking. And he said, I made a decision. I don't want to wake up right now. Can you imagine that? I don't want to wake up right now. 
And, but then eventually, obviously, he did because I was talking to him. But I'm telling you, church, I know the Spirit of God is talking to you. If you're a child of God, the Spirit of God lives within you, and that Spirit is telling you to wake up. Wake up. Have you heard of plain possum? Well, if you have a possum, which they're one of the ugliest things to me, they're just ugly, but they are usually peaceful animals. I went and read this, and I thought this was quite amazing. They prefer to avoid a fight at all possible. They move slowly on the ground, and they are very vulnerable to predators, which includes dogs, coyotes, and foxes. If corners, a possum will hiss and growl, even bite, but more likely, however, they will faint in shock at the prospect of being con of confrontation. Or, as is most commonly known, they'll play dead. While the ability to play dead has probably saved a lot of their lives, it also comes with its own set of risk. If a possum goes into shock in the middle of the road, it's unlikely that a driver will swerve to avoid hitting him because he looks like he's already dead. There are also many possums, now get this, many possums are buried alive because people think they're dead. Church, wake up. This world thinks, the world, thank you God, the world thinks the church is gone. The world thinks the church is powerless. The world thinks, that's what the world thinks. And I say that because if the, if the world did not believe that, I don't believe that there would be some things going on. I don't believe that you'd have a show on TV where they're using children to blaspheme God's name. I don't believe that there'd be open sin everywhere if, if, they, if, they, if these people in this world knew the church was alive and well. Because if the church would rise up in the name of the Lord and get back in their prayer closets and pray, there would be holy fear would cross this land. And I believe that. Because the world, a lot of people in the world think all the church is good for is if they're in trouble, they can run to it and get food. Or if they have a loved one who's sick or whatever, you better believe you're going to get a call. But otherwise, I don't need you. But the world needs to see God's church is alive and well, and we're very, very awake. Not just a few of us, mighty armies of us. Well, I'm telling you what, church, wake up. The church, we have played possum long enough. We cannot continue to dance to the music and constantly sit, contently sit in a pew. Church, wake up. The devil comes against the church and will continue until he casts it forever, until the devil is cast into the lake of fire. Church, be encouraged. We have all we need to be victorious. The devil is not, his demons are not going to leave you alone. No, they're not. But how much wonder, more great would it be if you stood up and it's like I've seen it on, I, I think on the computer. What does the devil say when you wake up? I pray to God. He says, oh no, here she is. But I pray it's all the time. Even when you're asleep, even when you're laying in your bed, you can be a powerful if you wake up. Wake up. Wake up. I remember there was a young boy who, now he's a grown man, he was in a horrible accident. And I remember for the, because he had bad head injuries. And I, I remember for the longest time, they was not sure if he was going to survive this or not. But we would go, his mom allowed me to go with him in his room. And we'd, we'd, we'd play Christian music. We'd have on powerful preaching. We never let it be quiet with the word. And guess what? He came out of it and he remembered a whole lot. Church, wake up. It is not okay for us to sit back and just let life go on. It isn't okay. You're put here for a reason. In the book of Matthew 16, 18, it says, And I tell you, you are Peter, which is, means a large rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the powers of, of Hades, shall not overpower it. That part of the Greek where the Lord Jesus said the, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word prevail means to be superior to and to overcome. So he's saying the gates of hell will not overcome the church. The choice is we've got to make, I want to be in that army. I want to be active in that army. I don't want to be absent without leave. I don't want to be, I don't want to be just sitting on the sidelines watching things. I want to be right in the middle of what God's doing for this world. I want to 
be one of the ones on the front line of this world of telling the world, you may think we're down and out, but the church of mighty God is on the rise. We will not be overcome because God said the gates of hell will not prevail against it no matter what the world throws our way, no matter what threat the world has, no matter if it gets to the place where you can't preach the truth behind a pulpit in a building, there's a cornfield out there, there's a tree out there, there's a parking lot out there, there's a, no, you cannot silence the word of God. Woo, Jesus, the gates of hell. The gates of hell. So at times I think we have a mindset, as long as I'm doing well, I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm here to remind you again that the boat has been rocking, but we have become too accustomed to that rocking. I want to rock the boat. I want to stand up for the right. I, I, I want to, that's what I want to do. And many times you're going to stand up for the right and you're not going to have a crowd, but I'm not standing up for the crowd. I'm standing up for the Lord. My God, there's this man who was on the Titanic, and his name was John Harper. And on board the night that, that, that it hit the iceberg, he, he had his daughter, who was only six years old, was aboard the boat with him. According to documented reports, as soon as it was apparent the, bur the, the boat was going to sink, he immediately took his daughter to a lifeboat. He put her in that lifeboat, but I won't read the whole story. It's an amazing story, but he put his daughter in that lifeboat so she would be safe, but he wouldn't get in there even though there was room for him. You know what he did? He got in those waters, those icy waters, and he went to as many people as he could to make sure they were ready to meet the Lord because he knew they were going to die. I'm telling you, the ship, the, the ship has run into an iceberg. And it is more time. We have got to be about the Father's business because the day of the Lord is coming. I'm telling you it's here. And if we truly believe the many voices that Jesus is coming, my, my question is where's the urgency? Where are you living urgently? Where's the change? Where's the action? If we truly believe that, what are we doing differently? Just like this man, this man, it was a, I, bought, I got the story and it was amazing. It said, listen to this, Harper had tried to lead this man to Christ. Okay, 1,528 people went into those waters out of the Titanic. John Harper was seen swimming frantically to the people in the water, leading them to Jesus before hypothermia became fatal. He was he didn't worry about his own life. It, it was because why? Because he was alive. He was alive in Christ. Mr. Harper swam up to one young man who climbed up on a piece of the ship. And Mr. Harper asked him between breaths. He said, are you saved? The young man replied that he was not. Harper then tried to lead him to Christ, only to have the young man who was near shock replying no. Then Mr. Harper took off his life jacket and threw it to the man and said, Here then, you need this more than I do. And he swam to other people. A few minutes later, he swam back to the young man and succeeded to lead him to salvation. Of the 1,528 people that went into the water <clears throat> that night, six were rescued by lifeboats. One of them was a young man swimming on the debris. F four years later, at a, a meeting of the people who survived, this young man stood up and in tears recounted how John Harper had led him to Christ. Mr. Harper had tried to swim back to help other people, yet because of the intense hole, cold, he had grown too weak. His last words before he went down in the, in the frigid waters is, Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Does Hollywood remember this man? No. He well, oh well, no matter. This man of God did what he had to do. While other people were trying to get their life self into a lifeboat and being only thinking of themselves, 
He gave up his life so others could be saved. He knew what urgency meant. That's what I'm talking about. It is that deadly. Do we not see that? Do we not understand the, the trumpet of God is getting ready to sound at any moment. And it is that desperate. Just like John Harper was when he was in those frigid waters after the Titanic had, had sunk. And that he it was it's no longer sparing his own life. He knew his life was right with God. If you know your life is right with the Lord, don't worry about it. Go minister to someone else. Go find someone else who maybe they aren't. Oh my God. Listen, if we truly believe it, Oh, I, like we said just at the beginning, when we think of John the Baptist, all he said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He spoke a faithful message. He paid the price, the ultimate price, his life. The world did not like John's message and spoke out against John's message. But John understood the message was greater than his life. When John the Baptist, he, 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 he was the one who the, the Herod or whatever, his, his wife, his, her daughter or whatever, was wanting John the Baptist's head because John the Baptist told them the adultery you're getting ready to commit is wrong. Church, people of God, men and women of God, boys and girls of God, we must stand in this last hour. Stand, don't give in to the lies of this world. Don't compromise the holiness of God. My word. And if you speak faithfully, Get this, you will face that yourself. There, 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 well, there's decision time coming. There's decision time every day. We have to choose who we're going to serve. Choose. And he said, whether you speak faithfully about health mandates, abortion, marriages, of same-sex marriages, adultery, idolatry, it doesn't matter. The world and our own soulful flesh will fight against you and try to get you silenced. But you are just like John, called to speak and live the truth of God's message to face the world's anger against you. People are not, do not like to be told they're wrong. But you know what? When I get this, and if this says you're wrong, you're wrong. If this, if the word of God tells me what I'm doing is wrong, it's wrong. And that's the same thing. We, what? Wake up! The day of is approaching. The day is approaching. Listen to this. My, my, my. David Wilkerson. I love David Wilkerson. He, this is from one of his um, messages. It said, the New Testament gives many warnings that mockers will appear in the last day. And my gracious, this was written years ago. And if that is not today, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. Mockers. People mocking God. People tempting the Lord. People even coming into church, even into a church service with such an irreverence. You're tempting God. But he says, there will be given a lot of warnings that mockers will come in the last days, ridiculing the doctrine of Christ's coming. People are not living like Jesus is coming. When, when the, on the Titanic, all those people were having fun. They were having a great time. They, they were having, everything was great. But it still sank. We've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. Even, I just, it gets me upset. It gets me upset because it's like, God, you've given us every single thing we need to live a life of victory. Every single thing we need to live a life of holiness. You've given, you've supplied every single need according to your riches and glory. Every need. What more do we need? We need nothing. Nothing but the Lord. And the book of, oh gosh. It says, listen. Back in Peter. Back in Peter 3. And four. Second Peter chapter three. Oh my gracious. I'm telling you, we need to get on fire for God. Second Peter three, three and four. <clears throat> Let me start as I always do at two. I want you to remember and understand what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. First, 
I want to remind you that in the last days there will be scoffers who will laugh at the truth and do every evil thing they desire. Now, would you tell me if that's not 2020? If, would you tell me if that's not 2020? Where people will do just what they want, oh my, and do every evil thing they desire. This will be their argument. Our Lord Jesus promised he would come back, but he hasn't. Then where is he? That's the mindset today. I don't answer to no one. I don't have to get anybody's approval. I'm not under anybody's ruling. I'm, I don't have to obey the rules. Well, I'm telling you, it's nothing new. This will be their argument, he said. This will be that. You don't have to say a lot of things out of your mouth. Your behavior speaks for itself. My behavior speaks for itself. And that is exactly, again, I'm going to read that again. Do every evil thing they desire. I can remember when I was young, and I mean, I'm 66 years old. So maybe some of you, that seems like real old. And it is real old to some. But I can remember, and it hadn't been that long ago. Lines of right and wrong were more clear cut than they are today. Lines of good and bad. But the thing is, the lines with God never change. Never change. And we can go back to talking about Roe versus Wade. We can go back to talking about taking prayer out of school. We can go. But where was the church? Where were the people of God? We should be, again, on our faces. We should be on our faces. I don't mean to go out there and protest and be ugly with the other people and act ugly to this people. No, pray, 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 and then go. Because you can't stay in your prayer closet. You gotta go, you gotta put feet to those prayers. My gosh, let me, oh Lord, let, let me finish this from David Wilkerson. He said, there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own flesh, saying, Where is the promise of this coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This, and what Mr. Wilkerson said, this can be heard today. What does anyone have to fear? All things continue just as they have. There's no reason to fear Judgment Day because it simply isn't coming. That's how people are living. People are living, and I dare say... Church people, we know better, are living like we don't have to give an answer for anything. But we do. Our very lives, the way we live our lives, we have to answer for that. The way we live our lives. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12 to 14, this, this sleeplessness is what Spurgeon said. I'll read it out of the scripture and then we'll go to Spurgeon. 5, 12 through 14. My word, my word, my word. It is a shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But when the light shines on them, it becomes clear how evil things things are. And when your light, it will expose their easier to evil deeds. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Let's go back to Ephesians 5, 10. Try to find out what's pleasing to the Lord. That should be our, that should be our every day. What, Lord, what is pleasing to you? Not what's pleasing to Joan. Not what's pleasing to the denomination. Not what's even pleasing to a country. What's pleasing to you, God? That's what this election's about. God, what's pleasing to you? What's pleasing to you? Try to find out what's pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, rebuke and expose them. It is, and, and then he goes on to, it is shameful even to talk about those things. Here it says, this, this is what Spurgeon said, this sleeplessness in the Christian is exceedingly dangerous. Two, because he can do a great deal while he's asleep that will make him look as if he were awake. I've known people, when my brother was little, he used to sleepwalk. And mommy used to have to lock the door because he used to sleepwalk. I've heard of people who slept, who were sleepwalking would get up and make an entire meal. Now, wouldn't that be nice? Made an entire meal, had it on the table, and were sleepwalking. Imagine that. I've known, I've heard some people who have gone out of their home and done things and they were sleepwalking. Be careful. Be careful. 
we can speak when we are asleep. We can hear when we're asleep. We can walk when we're asleep. We can sing when we're asleep. We can think when we're asleep. The man who is asleep doesn't care what becomes of his neighbors. How can he while he's asleep? And oh, some Christians who don't care whether the souls are saved or damned because they're asleep. It is enough for them if they're comfortable. If they can attend a respectable place of worship and go with others to heaven, they're indifferent about everything else. That's a person who's asleep. That's a person who is asleep. That's a person who, if it doesn't bother you, it should bother us that people are going to hell every day. It should burden us. We should cry about that. We should cry out for souls because hell is forever. And it should bother us. In the book of Romans chapter 13, 11. Besides this, you know the time. Now listen to this. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand because we know the danger of the times and we anticipate the soon return of Jesus. We should be all the more emergent, energetic, and committed to a right walk with God instead of sleep walk with God. Let me read that again. The night is far spent. Time's winding up. Think that trumpet's getting ready to sound. My gracious, the day is at hand. Because we know the danger of times and we anticipate the soon return of Jesus. Anybody who has any kind of thinking, even people who are lost, know something's going to have to give in this world. This world has become a, such an evil place. This world has become such a, a just it's a hard place to live in. This world, it, it's not recognizable to a lot of older people, and I mean older than myself. I've heard them say it. They don't even recognize America. What, what's happened? The church is asleep. And when you might say, well, how come we can put all the blame on the church? Because the power is in the hands of God. The power is within us. We can move mountains should it be God's will. I just read that this morning in my prayer closet. The, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Because we know the danger of the times and anticipate the soon return of Jesus, we should be all the more energetic and com committed to right walk with God instead of a deep sleep with God. We're not going to be able to stand before God one day and say, well, God, I was sleeping. I'm sorry, I didn't even know. Because you know what? If you're sensitive to the Spirit, the Lord can wake you up out of the deepest sleep. He sure can. How important it is to awake out of sleep. It's impossible to do many Christian things yet essentially be asleep towards God. We, I hear, I've heard it time and time again. Oh, I wish I could see the dead raised, and I wish I could see this. It, God is not a show. He does those things to glorify him, not to get you excited. Yes, it's awesome to see someone raised from the dead. I've witnessed it myself. Yes, it's awesome to see someone here. I've witnessed it myself. But it's awesome to see a person who's been on drugs truly give their heart to God and weep and cry before the Lord. That's the most wonderful miracle. I've seen it myself. I, I saw a woman in New Orleans like that. It was amazing. God is not here for your entertainment. You are here for his, his work. You are here to seek to go and find his lost children. You're here to encourage them. You're here to stand right. You're here to uphold the precepts of God. That's why you're here. You're here to use your voice, not to toot your own horn, but to tell how great thou art. That all and to encourage somebody. That's what you're here for. But you can't do those if you don't wake up. Wake up to the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Woo! Because one can do many religious things and still be asleep towards God. It's important for every Christian to make sure they're truly awake and active in their life before God. First, I want to write this one down. First, Thessalonians 5 and 6. First, that. Thessalonians. Sometimes I have trouble saying those words. Five and six. So, 
then let us not sleep as others do. Let us remain awake and sober. Therefore, let us not sleep, this is another translation, because we, can, we do not belong to the night or the darkness. First Thessalonians 5.5 5. Therefore, let us not sleep because we do not belong to the night nor of darkness. Our spiritual condition should never be marked by sleep. Spiritually sleeping, we need to be active, aware, to watch, and be sober. Who is going to proclaim? Who is going to proclaim? Who is going to tell? Who is going to seek? Who is going to pray for the lost? We can't be asleep and still do it. We are not to sleep. Paul used a different word for sleep for, as meaning in death in the other chapter. The word sleep here is used metaphorically to denote indifferent spiritual realities on the part of a believer. In the book of 1 Thessalonians 4.13, the word sleep is used for a person sleeping in Christ. This sleep is used to show indifference. In other words, I'm sleeping. I don't know nothing. I'm sleeping. I don't know nothing. That's what he's talking about. We can't afford that. We cannot afford not to, to be awake for your own family. You cannot afford that. Oh, my God. Let us not sleep. This is so much... Uh, the metaphor... It means ignorance. Sleep speaks of how much we belong to the world. Sleep means to, to be un, uncaring not, and not, not worried about it. The metaphor here expresses not so much actual sin as carelessness in spiritual and moral things. Carelessness. Well, you can't be careless about your own soul. You can't be careless about your own lifestyle. We talked about that last week. What's on your mind? Your mind needs to change to where what God says is good is good and what God says it is not is not. What God says is holy is holy and what God says is not holy is not. It speaks of inactivity. Sleep speaks of no defense. It means insensibility. Ignorance. 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 First Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is near. I'm wait, wake up! The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and sober so that you can pray. John chapter four, verse I mean chapter nine, verse four. I must work the works of Him that sent me while it's day. The night cometh when no man can work. I'm telling you, wake up! Woo! Wake up! Jesus is coming soon. In the book of Romans, chapter. 13, 11. Besides this, you know what a critical hour that it is. How it is high time now for you to wake up and out of your sleep rise to reality for salvation. Final deliverance is nearer to us than when we first believed. It is, when, if you were saved yesterday, you're, it's, it's, you're that much closer to the Lord coming back. Every moment when I began this message, I'm closer to when the Lord's coming back than when we started this message. Do we get not get it? Wake up! Woo! Jesus, wake up. Wake up, people. It's nearer than we first believed. Adhere to our relied on Christ. Wake up. Time is running out. Romans chapter 13, 11. The believers should do everything, keeping in mind the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Get saved. Get right. Get tell as many people to and imagine. Imagine looking at this world just like John Harper did, and seeing all those souls. And his determination was: even if I lose my life, I've got to go tell somebody to be sure their heart's right with God, because they he knew they were not going to survive. Well, let me tell you what: nobody's going to leave this world without having to go either to heaven or hell. This world is dying out. They're dying out. People all over are dying young, old. We've got to tell, wake up, church. We must wake up from apathy of being lukewarm in the book of Revelation 3. We must wake up for, from complacency. 1 Corinthians 1, 15, 58. Therefore, my brethren, be firm, stand fast, immovable. Immovable, always immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always being superior, excelling, doing more than enough. 
in the servants of the Lord, knowing and being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile, it's not wasted. That is telling us don't be complacent. Whatever you do for God, do it 100%. Give it all. Lay it all on the floor. Oh my. We must wake up from indistant and in being indifferent in the book of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. You must commit yourself wholeheartedly to this command that I'm giving you today. We must wake up to the urgency in our lives. Mark chapter 13. But concerning the day of that hour, no one knows. No one knows. You don't know. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son of Man, but only the, only the Father. Be careful. Watch. You don't know the exact time. Mark chapter 13, verse 32, 33. Let me read it again. This needs to wake you up. Wake up. Oh my gosh. You know what gets me? It gets me because I see so many people dying. There was a young man we, we know um, through a relative, 14 years old, killed himself the other day. 14! We need to tell people Jesus is coming. Tell them there is hope. Tell them that your sins can be washed away. Tell them that you, you do know that Jesus is coming back, that he's alive and well. Oh my, he said, but concerning the day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be careful and watch, people. You don't know the exact time. Matthew 24, 42. Watch, therefore. This is how they amplify. Give strict attention, be cautious and active, for you do not know in what kind of day, whether near or remote one, your Lord's coming. In the next verse, but understand this. Had the householder known in that part of the night whether, when, watch when the thief was coming, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be undermined and broken into. You must be ready, therefore. The Son of Man is coming in an hour when you don't expect him. It's time to wake up. Luke. And when he got up from prayer, when the Lord Jesus Christ, Luke 22, when he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples, found them sleeping from grief. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Get up and pray. Pray that you don't enter into temptation. I'm asking you, why are we sleeping? This is not the time to sleep. This is the time to pray. This is the time to pray. This is the time to pray. This is the time to have your ears open so God can lead you where he wants you to go. This is the time to quit playing the, the games of the world. This is the time to get on fire for God. Matthew, he says, no, the book of Revelation 1-7, Behold, he's coming quickly with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth wail on the account of him. Even so, amen. Even so, oh my God. Rome, I mean in the book of John 9, 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. God's telling us continually, don't go to sleep. Don't, don't go to sleep. And that doesn't mean don't go to sleep for your body. I'm talking about spiritual sleep. The church has been in the comatose of the state long enough. He says, the, the book of Romans 9, 28. For the Lord will carry out his sentence unto the earth fully without delay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Proverbs 1, 32. For the simple are killed by turning, their turning away and the complacency of fools destroy them. We, if we can't get excited that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, we have a problem. We have a problem. Does that mean what happens in the world doesn't concern you? It should concern you for one reason, to be sure everyone gets saved. That should be the only thing concerning us. Listen what he tells us in Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. He repent. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. I'm asking you today, what is it that'll wake us up? What is it that'll make it so vivid to us? 
What is it that will break our hearts so that people would go to hell? Read his word and pray. And when you pray, you pray for the heart of God. I pray many times, Lord, break my heart. What breaks your heart? And you know what breaks his heart? For his to be lost. This has been, the Lord's done something wonderful. I pray that you are challenged. I am. When I stand behind this podium, pulpit, whatever you want to call it, when I stand behind here, I'm not standing at like, you all need to hear this message. No, I need to hear this message. I need to ask the Lord to search Joan. I need to ask the Lord, if I'm asleep, wake me up. Time is at hand. I tell you what, a few few weeks ago when the storms were coming uh, around Louisiana, I prayed and prayed and prayed. Not just for my son, but for those who could be in the wake of the storm. I'm telling you, we need to be that urgent. We have got to get a sense of urgency in the world, in, in, in the church. Urgency. Not to come meandering and, you know, here I am and I'm going to sing a few songs. What, what would happen? What would happen if we would come in and the Lord say, ain't going to be no songs just fall on your face today? Oh, heavens, I pray so. I pray so. I pray this has challenged you today. I, I don't apologize for the Word of God. I never do, never will, never have, and won't do it now. I just thank Him for His mercy. I just thank Him for His warnings. I thank Him for His love. And I pray that you take this Word and let it burn within you and stir you up. And you know what? There's nothing more exciting than living a life with eyes wide open for the Lord. Eyes wide open. The Lord knows your body needs sleep, natural sleep, and they're as of course. But your your spirit does not need to have spiritual sleep. That can be deadly. Let's pray. I pray today that if there's someone watching this today who does not know the Lord, or maybe there's someone who's the Lord has quickened you like, you know what, you, you're being spiritually asleep. All you've got to do is repent. That's all. If listening to a message like this gets you mad, you better figure out who you're mad at. So I get mad at myself sometimes. But then I repent and I say, God, you know what? I'm sorry that I've been whatever. And he's faithful and just to forgive. If you're lost and you don't know the Lord is your Savior, he'll, for, he'll, he'll wash all your sin away with the blood of Jesus. All you got to do is admit you're a sinner. Admit you're a sinner and believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died and rose again for your sins and that here the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can wash your sin away. And then confess out of your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life. I pray that today. So I thank you. And Lord, I just ask, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that this word would bring forth fruit for your glory, God. That the church would wake up because time's short. Time is so short. And sometimes I do feel like John Harper, Lord, trying to get people to understand that, God, you love them so much. God, your people can do more than we're doing. And I ask you to forgive us, Father. Forgive us. Forgive John. Amen. Amen. See you next week, Lord willing.